And when you have like creatives that worked on things like the matrix and like different visual effects, they came with different skill sets. They came with a really high end vision, uh, visual capability of doing something, but lack the understanding of like, okay, you want to do this, but you have to do it in this little box. You're listening to creative leadership with heart, a podcast that inspires people to take action and be the leader they were born to be. I'm Coach Rico, and I'm known for coaching and training executives, leaders, founders, and high performers at Fortune 100 businesses, startups, and more. I'm a 20-year creative executive, leadership and life coach, author, speaker, and serial entrepreneur. I'm here to answer your questions about leadership and personal development while also asking you questions that can unlock your untapped potential. All right. Uh, welcome back to Creative Leadership with Heart. Today, we got a good friend of mine, Amir Ghani. Uh, he's a leader in creative production and operations. He's also been a leader in talent management. Um, he's had a, an amazing journey from Lucasfilms to starting his own deli, which we'll talk about later, um, to Netflix. And now he's doing work at a creative post-production house out in Australia. Um, yeah, and I met Amir. He was on the team. He's out in Singapore. So that's also something we can dig into what life is like um, in the Southeast. Uh, but yeah, Amira, welcome. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. This is great. Yeah, um, I've been always excited. Early morning, 8 a.m. I've been actually up since 6.30 ready for this call anyway. So super yeah, stoked no. about it. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. Thank you. I know it's uh, it's tough with the time zone. But yeah, so we'll just jump, jump right in. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your creative journey. Yeah, so um, I've always been kind of a part of the creative journey uh, process or part of that creative uh, creative world, it would say. So I, I started um, going to, I first went to a, a fine art school. I was in film, even if you wanted to look back when I was in high school, like I'll tell you, like if you watch the film Rushmore, I feel like I was that guy. My academics were never that great, but I swear to God, I think I was in every extracurricular program you could possibly imagine. Theater, staging, production management, film. Like it was, I was, involved in anything and everything in high school so i find myself sort of you know steering towards a bit more of the, the fine art side of things and ended up going to a fine art school in vancouver so originally canadian uh born and raised in the great white north um and you know been there did my schooling there with emily carr uh in vancouver and then i moved to singapore gosh 18 years now so i'm getting to that place where i've lived i may i may live here longer than where I was born, so I've got two more years till I get to that point. So uh, it was incredible that I've been here for about eighteen years, and so I could take you through that journey of of uh, how I got here as well a little bit later. But um, yeah, so I basically kind of got into the creative line just by by my own curiosity and and really looking and, and being involved in in the creative side. I found that when I went to fine art school, um, I became more like invested or I found myself leaning not towards so much the actual craft of creating uh, the work. So coming from a film background, I went from working in the camera department to like getting into the project management side of projects. So that's sort of the post side of school. But what I found where my strength was was actually in that sort of art, art history and really looking at artists um, and creatives and like looking at how they develop their work and even things like spaces that were created to have a discussions you know like the salons and really getting into the idea of discourse and discussion so that was kind of where my sort of um uh sort of my sort of my my world went towards is like really looking at the, the creative artists and i found that i was leaning into that even more when i got into uh the actual industry when i worked in the film industry and then i uh, ultimately found myself moving towards sort of project management side so i became the ad production manager on films and then slowly moved over to cg animation um and so that kind of was my trajectory towards it how i got myself into creative the creative side is basically i found myself really 
uh, good at knowing how to one work with creative artists, you know, uh, develop those sort of uh, relationships with them, and keep them honest towards their deadlines. So th there's always a sort of operational side to me that I've always had, and I think that's where my strengths were to actually keep close to artists and really kind of keep them honest towards their work as well. Um, and uh, that's kind of what's created my sort of uh, my, my my sort of growth towards that. Nice. Um, what was that moment? Because you said you went to a fine arts school, right? What was the moment that you're like, oh, this is what I want to do? So like, not I don't know. Like, I didn't even think of going to a fine arts school. And, and you know, I love creative work. But, but what was that moment? It, for me, it came later. It, it was like it, creative was my hobby, right? I was doing stuff on the side. Yeah. But in your traditional Asian upbringing, you know, creative isn't really an option, right? <laughs> um, so for at least for in my family. Um, so creative was on the side for me and I turned it into a career later. But for you, what was the moment that you're like, this is the kind of work I want to do? I think that uh, if I if I look back and this is kind of like even going back to like high school, um, I, I always loved cinema. Like I love watching Martin Scorsese films and I really got into, you know, uh, cinema was always kind of my world. Um, I was raised as a, you know, I was raised as a um, MTV child. So every music video in Canada, I guess it's called much more music. Um, but that was kind of my thing, right? Like I love music videos and I love cinema. And these are two things that I kind of gravitated towards and actually really as it, where my curiosity first kind of leaned into. And I found myself in high school, like I said, kind of getting involved in things like you know, theater production, you know, and like working in the video, the video department. And it was weird because I was also kind of a sports nerd. So I was also playing like, uh, you know, I was playing like American football and I was playing like rugby and stuff like that because I've always been a relatively big guy. And so it was interesting having these two sort of absolutely distant sort of personalities that actually kind of developed sort of who I am because I think my capabilities to work with multiple people and actually build those relationships to actually strive for a singular goal didn't necessarily come from the creative side that I was I was curious about, but I actually think it came from my sports side where I was playing with team members and actually having to learn how to play with team members and build those rapports and being able to work as a, as a, as a unit to really show success. And I think there's this sort of hybrid that I was able to kind of lean into. So I think that's where my my curiosity went to. I, like I said, I found myself, like my, if I had to take, there, I have an older brother and there's just my brother and I, and he is the academic in the family. Like he's the high scholar, you know, he's a professor in, you know, uh, in sociology and political science. Like he's just one of, he's incredible, a lovely person, not me. So my parents kind of had two different realms of children, one that was really the high scholar and then one that just really couldn't figure out academics. And I think that's why fine arts school was perfect for me. Um, it was an area where I was able to like, you know, I was creating small little, you know, featurettes and little, I was doing little music videos and I was playing around with that format where I felt like, you know, I can, I got myself into a school where I felt like I was doing work. I did decide to take a couple of years off before doing um, uh, going into university, uh, going into fine arts school, because I still wasn't really prepared to know what I wanted to do. And I think within that period as well, like I moved to London, I worked at the film co-op. I was really kind of growing up as a professional or a young, you know, aspiring kid that wants to try to get into something. And I think I found a lot of 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 meaning when I looked at the work I was starting to kind of do there at a really, really young age, like we're talking 19, 20 at that point. And then going to the, university, uh, the fine arts school was kind of the, the natural path towards where you go. Obviously, like you, traditional parents, you know, um, they were like, at some point you gotta go to school. Um, but I think, uh, I think I got a bit of a free card because my brother was such a scholar. <laughs> I was able to kind of, I'm gonna do this, you got him. He he he's giving you all the academics. I think I'm going to try this, and they were very supportive of it. You know, so you know they were they they still to this day. I don't think they know what I do. I uh, don't really understand it, but you know, I think they 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 still love me for that sake. So I think that's kind of how I found myself kind of going towards it. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, I, I don't know that I my parents could explain. I don't think my parents ever. They knew where I worked, and they would tell their friends that. 
but they never knew like what I do. Um, so that, <laughs> that's <laughs> something we definitely have in common. Um, so, so after fine arts, which is kind of continuing down your your yeah. journey, um, after you graduated from school, what was your first like major gig? So after I finished fine art school, I actually went into the film industry. Um, I, I actually studied film uh, when I went to fine art school. So I went to Emily Kerr Institute of Art and Design in Vancouver. Um, and it was interesting because it was the year that I graduated. I was the first student out of that school to do a graduation piece in digital. So everything else was filmed before. So we were shooting Bolex and 16 mils. And, you know, that was, we were that last of that generation that were actually playing. Like we had a steam back. So I was actually cutting film on a steam back. Like it was incredible. Um, I, and, wait, wait, wait. I hope, I hope for people that don't know what that is to go look it up because I think we're dating ourselves when we actually have like real to real actual film. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to go. <laughs> no, no problem. It's a good point to make people like, what are you talking about? Um, linear editing at its finest. Uh, uh, but yeah, like it was. Um, so I found myself moving into film. Uh, I found myself moving um, into the camera department. I was curious about photography and I was actually getting more and more into that. And so I, for my first sort of few years, I found myself working uh, again in Vancouver's film industry. I was working on a few feature films, a bunch of commercial projects. Um, but ultimately, I, 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 I started to resent that industry. And I feel bad for that, but it's true. I actually felt like, um, I felt like it was a bit of a cutthroat industry in the sense that your progressions are really stunted unless you it's who you know and, and it, it's really a a level of gift to the gab like versus your capabilities um to a degree you know i think and that's where i i, I kind of felt like a bit of resentment to the industry um following that i actually had a few friends that were working in the cg animation industry and they asked me if i wanted to join you know um so i took a massive pay cut and i became like a production assistant took a role at mainframe entertainments which was uh, um one of the, probably the pioneer studio to do CG television animation. So they were the ones that figured out how to actually, how do you take this this format and actually create, you know, 24 episodes of 30 minute shows in one season, you know, and like they're they're remarkable. They're 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 legends of that sort of style. Great OGs to work for. Um, so I, I decided to take that chance and go for it. I was still, you know, relatively young in my early 20s. And so um, when I did that, that was probably the best thing I could have done. Um, it was a young industry. It was emerging. It was curious. Um, the work wasn't arrogant. I think there was a lot of just motivation and drive, not just by the business itself, but by the creatives themselves as well. Um, you know, this is early 2000s we're talking about. And so um, to, to, to be a part of that, at that time was incredibly um, grateful for myself, getting that opportunity and finding that sort of sweet spot. And then just growing with some incredible producers and head of uh, studios that really were not necessarily about um, creating a really big business, but really doing disruptive work and really thinking about how do we create some of the best you know, animation possible and what does that look like and what does that process look like and how do we actually um how do we actually keep improving on what we know and so because of that i felt like my growth my growth into sort of uh creative leadership was was beginning at that point it was where i really began to sort of hone in my skills and i have always said like you know every great leader should start at like a PA role because you need to be known, you need to have tasks to do, and then you need to know how to coordinate those tasks, and then you need to know how to manage those tasks. And this is kind of your stepping stones of really getting the, the real understanding um, of how to not necess not only know how to, how to do the work at hand within that industry, but also learn to know how to work alongside other people and how to actually develop those relationships that can actually benefit not necessarily yourself, but also the project at hand and, and the team at hand as well. So you're really learning a lot of different sort of soft skills beyond sort of those hard skills that you're kind of gaining as well. And it's intended for that, I feel like. Um, and so I spent about three and a half years with, with 
uh, mainframe where, like I said, it started as a PM and ended as a producer. We did a couple of music videos out of there uh, where I was able to actually bring the work to the studio versus like taking on a project that the studio would have um, and did a bunch of CG projects from there. Following that, so I stayed with them for quite some time. And then um, a friend of mine who was the production manager for Lucasfilm Animation reached out to me. And it was just, it was a funny story because I was like, they're telling me about Singapore. There's a role in Singapore. And I was like, Singapore? I'm like, what am I gonna do in Singapore? I'm like, I even, they're like, dude, all my friends are like, it's like, it's Star Wars. You know, you're single, why don't you go live your life and understand the other side of the world as well? And it was really my best friends that kind of like gave me that push of like, you should really think about this. And taking on that 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 awareness was the best thing, you know, to really put my put myself in a vulnerable position where I didn't have my mentors with me. I didn't have sort of that support structure any longer, like really putting myself into another world and really seeing my capabilities of being able to produce work uh, and a studio you know, on my own, which was pretty daunting for something like Lucasfilm as well. Yeah. So um, there was a lot you you went over in there and some some stuff I want to dig into, right? Yeah. You said you had a lot of resentment um, for the film industry. And one is, did you carry that on? Or two, what was it that helped, helped you either lose that resentment or like see start to like move away from that that resentment um i think me leaving the industry and going to another industry where we can still make creative work uh, and work alongside people again i'm a people person so it's like if if i if i get to work with um a team that's that kind of gets me to where i needed to be and i felt like why uh I, I should say in, in the in the live action side, I never actually resented the work we were doing. So like being on set, right. um, filming, like that stuff. And the team that I had there um, and the teams that I worked with, like the DOPs and the first camera, and like those guys were incredible. And like, I really enjoyed that work. But I think it was just frustrating to see that one, um, some really talented people that I knew weren't getting those opportunities. And a lot of that had to do with them being a little bit more introverted and not so, um, you know, good in the public eye. And it was almost a case of they were losing opportunities because of of that. And it was like, how do we find opportunities for them to get them work? And and not necessarily just about them, but just again, the whole the whole industry itself is 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 so it's so matured and it's so like these individuals that play these roles in these different departments or these different areas of your field is so institutionalized. And I think, I think that was the other big part of where uh, my frustration leaned into. It yeah. was this way or the highway, and there was no sense of chance to really delve into questions and look at things that can actually be a better form of solving, you know? And I think moving towards and really leaving traditional filmmaking, you know what I mean? Like feature films and commercials and stuff like that was really, I think was a good move for me because I think that type of work at that time, like I said, was just so rigid. It was so hard to do anything that could actually be somewhat interesting or compelling or like do any of any level was hard to find out i also think i was probably at a bit of a young age and my naivety was probably still you know being developed a little bit more and i think that's some of the parts where i felt like i struggled with it but i found that when i went to um when i went to cg animation it was like even the old school og sort of leadership that were part of it were still kind of constantly asking questions about the work that they were doing they were constantly thinking about like okay we just need to figure this out how are we going to do it like and to me that fee that, that 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 arena of work was so much more interesting um just because it's problem solving and i was just like yeah. well i really appreciated that versus like you need to do this and then do this and then this and that's it you know, and I was like, I I like the idea of pursuing, but also building my own professional 
um, capabilities at the same time. Like really knowing like, you know, as a PA or coordinator or a PM, it's like there are fundamental things that I still need to be able to do. There need, there's tools I need to develop within myself to be able to ask further questions or advance my capabilities of asking questions within the work that we do just because I've done this practice and I've kind of gotten myself to this point. So I felt like it was, it was, CG was able to give me that sort of platform and that sort of uh, venue to really kind of, ex kind of get back into that love of the work, I would say. Yeah. So, so we're I'm going to jump ahead and a yeah. little bit because the, the theme that I, what, what I want to ask you about, but the theme I'm also hearing, right, is you, you mentioned you took a pay cut, um, but but that actually opened up a lot more opportunity for you and it introduced you to new things and more collaboration and solver, solving big, bigger problems, right? And to some degree, that that industry you resented still sort of exists, right? Um, so like, what would you say for somebody who's like thinking about this or maybe a year in, they have like, one year on their resume, like what advice would you give them to, to navigate these things, right? Like just like you had to navigate it um, when you were going through it and, and you went through the different stages of like, do I want to do this? I actually don't like this. Then like, oh, this is what, what good teamwork looks like. You went through like all the ebbs and flows. So how would you advise somebody earlier in their career entering this and, and what would you tell them to do? Or what would, what advice would you give? I think there's, um, I would say there's two things that I would actually add, advise them on is to continually have a layer of curiosity to the work that you're doing or the field that you're in. Always be curious, always be curious, always be curious, because I think there's a, there's a, there is, a, there is, there's moments where you can lose your curiosity because you're getting caught up too much in what's in front of you um, and the work that you're doing versus asking the questions um, and still having that layer of curiosity. I think through curiosity will also then give the next point that I think is important to any young creative is developing your point of view and being a part of a conversation. Even if you feel like your point of view may not necessarily be the right or the wrong point of view, as long as you're a part of that discussion, your point of view will get developed and developed more. I think, I think what my my failure in say and this, I would say this would be maybe my failure in why film was something that I resented, is I didn't allow myself to have that curiosity any longer, and I got caught up in sort of what was happening uh, in front of me versus just focusing on. The curiosity and developing those um, points of views that I needed to actually know how to engage with people around me. Um, I don't ever kind of get into things like keep working on your technical skills because I think if you're into something you do, you're always honing your technical skills. It's how do you apply your technical skills and how do you how do you develop? And you'll find this is part of my theme that runs through a lot of things is how do you develop your narrative? What is that story you're always trying to tell? Or what is that point of view you are trying to get across through your creative or through what you're doing? And making sure that you have that sort of um, dialogue at that table. And that comes to curiosity. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And and that's something that like, that, you know, when I work with leaders from early on into career, even executives, like understanding their personal narrative and it because it's deeper than just what's your story it's like why why does what you do matter even just to you right and if you can't articulate why it matters to you how are you supposed to articulate that to the rest of the world right totally. and, and personal mission i think is super important which is a great segue into what is your why what is your personal mission when it comes to the work that you do gosh i think uh you know, at, at, the, at, the, at the bare, at the most sort of basic level of looking at why I love, like what keeps me kind of going is to see a singular piece of creative being developed and, and made by a group of people that are, are pushing the bound, uh, pushing, pushing the capabilities of what we do. And I think what that means is, are, am I creating enough conversation 
around the work that we do that's moving the needle of the work we're trying to do as well as and i always have to kind of bring this back are we moving the business forward i think the idea of of doing really great creative uh in a world where we we live in economics has to have some relationship to that to that to that to that, to that component and i think as i get older my relationship between the creative output and the 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 the, 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 the the, the yeah, sort of that creative output that we're looking to do has an alignment with what our business goals are kind of there for. And the business goals doesn't mean we should need to make a lot of money or anything like that. It could be about many different facets, but as long as it's aligning and we're staying sort of honest to those sort of um, those sort of benchmarks and goals that we set ourselves, I think those are kind of where I land the most. Um, I think for me, it's always going to be about working with creative. That's why I think it's interesting, you know, as you'll know, like going going from working for such big institutional global companies to really my my recent work getting really small and going to like a real boutique studio is a really interesting point for me, even as a creative leader, to really kind of go back to a space where the work can be sort of intimate and honest again a little bit and a little bit more dirty and hands-on if i have to say and i yeah. think in a way that to me is going to be some truly you know it's not about making the greatest projects for netflix or for like Lucasfilm. those were incredible times in my life and i think that has developed who i've become as not necessarily just as a leader but as a creative individual that can work with creatives and i think I, for me, it's always been this notion of trying to get back to sort of that simplicity. And it comes back to it. Are we creating enough conversations through our dialogue? And or do we have our, or do we have uh, an aligned narrative that we're trying to speak? So those yeah. are kind of where our lines. It, 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 I know I've kind of gone in different circles, but to try to distill it down to the most simplest form, those are the things. That I, yeah. I, and, I, and even it goes too. back to your, like, are we curious enough, right? Um, and one of the things is interesting because, you know, we both worked at Netflix, we both worked at big and small companies. Yeah. And the thing that I've learned along the way, and this is what I had, um, a lot of the clients I work with, you know, I talked to them about is it's, I forget who says it, uh, who said it and I'll have to look it up, but, but innovation is born out of constraint. Um, and if you think yeah. about it, like even at Netflix, there was always something that was constrained. It was either the timeline, it was never budget. <laughs> so, you know, budget was never a constraint, but it was either timeline or like capabilities, like technology, there was always a constraint, right? And people always like, well, I like to have my team think blue sky first and then you bring it down, but you need to put some, some constraints in, right? So like, because blue sky thinking can be like way out there and it can almost go too far. But if yeah. you say like, okay, but, I'm going to give you two weeks to think about it. Okay. That gives you some kind of constraint or do it yeah. with a $50,000 budget, right? Or do it with exist existing technology. Let's think there's some sort of constraint. Humans just are curious enough to your point and we'll find ways to work around those constraints, but that stretches our brain because we're like, okay, if I have to do this, how can I work around that and make it work for me? Right. And, and in the pre-show, these were some of the things that we we're talking about. You did a lot of this work at, at Lucas. And I'm sure you're doing a lot of this work now, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, that 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 idea that innovation is born on a constraint. 100 percent agree. Like, I think you're, you're you, you nailed it on the head there, especially because, like, you know, even going back to Lucasfilm, Lucasfilm is, is somewhat like like a Netflix in the sense that, you know, money wasn't really an issue. Like we we're making CG animation TV projects that we had no broadcast. So this was my first sort of notion of like, we're thinking differently, like coming from somewhere like mainframe where, okay, we've got a broadcaster and we've got a client. We've got a broadcaster that's telling us you need to have this many um, episodes delivered to us so that we can air it by this time. We were on the timeline. And so we know what we can actually do within that time. And I think we, what constraints do is it makes you create big bets. It makes you kind of go, look, we're just all in. We're just going to do it. Be it if it's going to be successful or not, we will pivot from that. You know, like we have to take that opportunity. We have to take that. We have to take that chance together. I feel like I learned that even more through Netflix where, or the, I learned the language of that and really studying that idea of like understanding like we're always taking big bets and we have to put those constraints on us to make sure that we take a, we 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 make a choice in what we want to do we go down that route and sometimes 
success comes from it. Other times, most of the times, you have to learn how to pivot. You have to learn how to maneuver and pivot from that decision so that we still get the best case scenario of what we try to deliver for. Um, Lucas told was exactly that as well. Like trying, like I said, trying to set up a TV animation studio that required to do Lucasfilm high quality standard animation that had never been done before. You know, like um, Clone Wars was a groundbreaking show. Okay, season one, we can put that, we can forget about season one of Clone Wars because that was a, and you can see through that show, that season, how much we were trying to solve for. That is the truth behind it because you're like, oh, it's super ugly. But like, you think about, what we had to put ourselves through, like how do we actually create a rig that an animator can use that modeler can texture from to light it to like how that can actually do at that time 2K, which we're like, why are we doing 2K? You know, uh, resolution work now. I, you know, um, it was all these different parameters, and we have, and when you have like creatives that worked on things like the matrix and like different visual effects they came with different skill sets they came with a really high-end vision uh visual capability of doing something but lack the understanding of like okay you want to do this we have to do it in this little box and how do you make it fit in this little box and i think that was a massive learning curve and i think putting those constraints would only have gotten to where we are with that show. Like at the end of the day, that show was groundbreaking. The way we were able to create that type of look and generate the type of uh, performances from those animations was, you know, people keep asking questions to this day on how that was actually done. And it was because, you know, it, it comes back to, like you said, having the constraints, but also putting, a, you know, sometimes the right team together in a way that, that, again, I always say like sometimes it's that team that just kind of comes together that are able to ask the questions that need to be asked and debate those things that need to be debated so that whatever decision we decide to go, we know what we're trying to do and we know how to solve from that from there on in. Yes, sometimes, again, you have to pivot because there's something that broke in that chain. But the fact is, is that that's going to happen in life. You know what I mean? You just need to know how to pivot whenever you need to do any of that kind of stuff. So I agree. I think it's interesting working for a company like Netflix or, uh, or um, uh, uh, Lucasfilm because it really did make you think about, you'd have to think about cost. You had to think about those other parameters that required a lot more. And it's actually harder when they tell you, well, it's not, it's not, it's not a budget issue because then yeah. they're telling you like, you want to do whatever you want to do, do it, you know? And you're like, okay, but now we're losing time. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it really becomes that case of how do you find that sweet spot within that place? You know, we also go about quality time and budget, like the, you know, if you can have two of those, three, you know, like pick your two, you can't have all three. So, yeah. And it, um, to your point, like when you also have unlimited resources, you're like, where do I start? Right. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to, to pivot a little bit because um, you have this uh, this little deviation in your journey. You you uh, opened a deli, and so did, what, what? I don't think you and I ever sat down and talked about this. What what was the intention? Was it a you wanted to get out of creative or in, in entertainment? Was it a side gig? What what was this uh, little detour you took? Yeah. So you know it was interesting so basically i'd finished another cg project off and i had some time off and uh i've always been a a, a, a bit of a foodie i was going to restaurants i got to know a lot of different chefs and stuff in singapore and so uh i was chatting with uh, a restaurant that i used to with all the time and i got to know the chef really well there and um and uh, him and i were just chit chatting it's like hey you know i've been chatting with this other chef and we've been thinking about starting a sandwich you know um uh, shop and wanted to think about doing something like that. And I was like, oh, I'm going to take you back to a little bit of Amir's back, his, his, his history. My parents owned a sandwich shop and a bakery back in Edmonton for like 40 years. So I actually grew up in a sandwich shop uh, my whole life. Um, and funny story when I, when I, when I get into this a little bit more. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, my my questions first were like, well, do we even have a product? Like, what are, what are what are we making? Like, do we have something that people would be interested in? You know, so we ended up doing a couple of just pop ups, you know, in in Singapore. And needless to say, it was a huge success. And 
we were making these ridiculously amazing sandwiches that I was like, okay, I think we actually had something here. Um, and again, I think it comes back to a little bit. I had an opportunity to work with two chefs in my mind or two creatives that were really, really young, hungry, and really kind of pushing their bars within their fields as well that wanted to do something super simple. And so I was like, okay, I think we could do something here. You know what I mean? So obviously asked the wife, I'm like, look, this is a massive pivot. You know, this is something that's completely different. Is this something that, you know, we are good with? And she's like, look, if you want to, you want to try this, go for it. You know what I mean? Like, we can survive through this. And I was a little bit like, you know what? I think I want to see what it's like to kind of set up a brick and mortar. You know, like what would it take to actually work alongside these two and actually make something tangible in hand, successful? And what I found when I went down this journey is a lot of what I've learned as a, a producer uh, and project manager is I was able to apply those skill sets into this field as well. You know. It's like anything you get yourself into, you have to learn what you're kind of getting in yourself into and really become the best at what that what that what that content or narrative you're trying to sell or you know, you need to understand it as best as possible. And I felt like going into this field, I was able to sort of learn how different team members come on board and how do we actually create a space where we can have a really good functioning team to produce really good work, uh, really good product, you know, and I think that's what we ended up doing. So we were able to sort of develop two things. One was uh, our products was really strong and then we were just able to really build a strong brand. And I think that's where my, my, my strength came into is like, well, let's think about the story we want to tell the public. Like, who are we? And I was working with our, with our, our creative uh, branding team and they were saying like, look, the story is really going to be about the three of you guys and this sort of journey of you guys and just sort of who you are as personalities. And we were able to sort of develop a really strong business from that. And I think for me, you'll find that like, I, I, I love challenges when it comes to whatever I do. Um, and I think looking at creative work doesn't necessarily just need to be something that goes on a television or goes on a screen or um, it can actually be within the real world of, of, of e-commerce or it could be in the real world of food and beverage as well. And I started to see that happening with a lot of the talent is these kids are just these, these young, talented chefs are doing interesting. You can see it. Even there's so many great like talents, even in where you're from in LA, there's some of these guys that are doing like these Thai restaurants on the street. And like, there's some incredible things that are happening that are pushing those sort of their own, their own capabilities. And for such a long industry to be doing sort of new movements within that sort of field, was compelling in a way, in, in a way too. So my my pivot towards it was nervous. It was again putting myself a little bit in a vulnerable spot. I'm putting myself out there to see how much um, I can sink or swim, basically. And I think I've always put myself in that position. I think by me putting myself in a vulnerable position, I come out of it becoming more rounded as an individual and as a professional as well. I learn from those wins that I get from it and lots of the mistakes <laughs> that you get from it as well. But that comes with just being vulnerable to being that. And I think that's how that pivot towards um, towards creating Park Bench Deli uh, was there. And I think ultimately why I ended up having to shift away from there is because the work itself wasn't growing. Um, mm. I wanted to grow the business. I wanted to scale. I wanted to put it in every airport and like really try to create this brand that can really kind of resonate across everywhere. But my business partner wanted to keep it still small and boutique-ish and they wanted to just focus on uh, the food at hand. And I was like, out of respect, I was like, look, that's, we've got that set up. We've got a really good successful model happening there. And so that's when I started having that conversation with Netflix. It was roughly around the same time. And hence, when I was like, you know what, I think I'm going to bow out. I'm going to look at this opportunity. I'll let you guys run this. Because for me, at that point, I just wasn't doing anything that would actually allow me to grow as a professional as well. Mm -hmm. And I've done everything to set the team up for success in a way that they know what they can do to make this successful. 
moving forward. And at that point, it was like, it's time for me to kind of find a, a new vulnerable space. And here came Netflix. Marketing world of Netflix was a, an eye opener for me because again, hired hired into Netflix with no marketing background except from my own brick and mortar, coming from a production background was a huge big bet that Lisa and my boss at the time took on me to join a company where everybody, you know this, everybody within their field are like incredible professionals within the field of work that they do. So to join Netflix at that point, to see that was intimidating, but also incredibly exciting for me because again, I'm putting myself in a place where, and I think at by this time too, I had developed a point of view that was, and my curiosity was there to be able to walk into conversations and just and 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 lean into my curiosity and ask questions and become more, um, just, um, just being more um, a scholar or trying to learn a student towards the place so that I actually knew how to actually part how I can actually contribute in a meaningful way at the same that way. Yeah, I mean, I love everything that you said in there. You know, the themes about being vulnerable, being curious. And I think one of the most important things is be uncomfortable, right? Because yeah. what I heard about everything that you did, you you are leaning into discomfort, you're leaning into challenge, you're leaning into growth. And I think that's a huge thing that people should take away from your story is no matter what it was, you you leaned into the discomfort. Like, I don't know, delis, yeah. let's do it. Right. I've never been in marketing. Let's do it. <laughs> right. Like all the things you did, you kind of just leaned in. You were curious. You were the consummate student. Right. And you know, you've built a, a long lasting career on on those fundamentals. So like yeah. if anyone I think is gonna take stuff away, like those are the things. Be just be uncomfortable, be curious, consummate student, be vulnerable. Like those are all great lessons. Yeah, I I, I think I think you know. As much as it's funny, I was never a great student, but I feel like I've become a student of, of the work that I do. And I feel like that that's that that that's I just feel like you if you're able to I, again coming back to developing a point of view and being a part of the conversation is always important. If you do not allow this is I, I'm gonna sidetrack a little bit here, and this might be an interesting point of view, is moving to Asia was what where I found it hard um, to work with talent that didn't necessarily know how to speak their own point of view or actually be more open to their own um, dialogue and discussion, discussion and debate. Well, I don't have debates with my, my, my supervisors. They just tell me uh, what to do and we do what's told. And, and that was a hard, that was a hard learning curve for me as a leader to try to work with talent that just didn't necessarily have that awareness of, of how they are to approach their own crowd. What I found in the early days is especially like in, when I first moved to Singapore in those first few years was they, and I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to seem demeanor or anything about uh, the roles, but there is, to be a great artist towards your field, you have to be able to know how to develop a point of view that you can speak on behalf of it. If you don't, I feel like sometimes you're a technician to the tool. You're actually there just to run and operate a tool versus knowing how to bring your color or your, your perspective to the performance or to the lighting scenario that you do and that compositional uh, style that you might bring that tells you a lot of things through that model you built and that and the, and the quality that you resonate within it reads because um, you I found when coming from North America you can't shut the artists up half the time because they do speak on behalf of which is great sometimes it's a little overly but that's at least a dialogue of, of point of views that people are talking right. and to come into a space where where like one percent of of the team is speaking and that's usually the expats and not necessarily the locals was hard you know and it was it was hard to really break them out of out of that um um 
uh, or develop that, not really break them out of it, more yeah. like teach yeah. them how to have a point of view and be okay to know how to talk about the work at hand. Um, I always come back to um, a scenario of where I was in, we had dailies uh, for animation. So basically these were all the animators or lighters. This was an animation deal. where all the animators would come into the theater and we'd look at all their work uh, together and the, and the supervisors would be there. I would be there because this would be always, I would love this time where I can actually just go look at the work and hear the conversations and then go deal with firefighting uh, for the rest of the nine hours that I'm there. Um, but this gave me that one hour of really spending time with the team and actually looking at the work. And what we found was is that in the early, the first sort of few sessions, it was just supervisors giving feedback to the creatives. Like, they're like, oh, fix this. Look at your anticipation on this shot. Your waiting is a little, you know, is not really there. Work on that a little bit more. And everyone's, you know, taking all their notes as hard as they can. And we, I literally had to tell my supervisor, I'm like, you got to change this. You have to change the, the process. You could do that at their desks. You can just go and tell them. I'm like, get them to ask, get them to give their thoughts on each other's uh, uh, of shots. And so that's what we ended up doing is like, you know, Jamie, tell us what you think about Bob's shot. He's like, well, you know, you could work a little bit more on the dialogue queuing here. And then like, Vanessa, what do you think? Yeah, that's a good point. And then they started to kind of develop this dialogue amongst each other, you know, and what was important by that is that the moment they all went back to their desks, you can you can shut them up. They were starting to talk to each other, like, "Hey, what did you do on this shot?" Da, da, da. And that was great because before it'd be like a ghost town. You'd go over to their area, and it's like you can hear a pin drop because no one's talking to them. Now there's like conversations, people leaning over each other's desks, looking at stuff, and that's all curiosity. That's all creating a point of view. That's all solving, you know, problems that they may have encountered within themselves that they can lean into somebody and actually have a, a debate around it. And yeah. I think that's where it was starting to resonate more and more. Have we been have we been able to get there to the same level as North America, Europe? No, you know. But we were. It's it's definitely moved. You know, it's definitely been evolving more and more and more. I just think culturally, there's still this sort of disconnect between having this really loud, sort of boisterous point of view versus being a little bit more restrained and being a little bit more. How does your point of view still come across but still having a level of restriction? So it's a balancing act, but it's kind of a lot better at that point. Yeah, that's a really great point. And if you're up for it, I'm going to ask you in the recording. So if you say yes, you're, I'm going to hold you to it. But to come back <laughs> and talk about how to lead global teams, because I've talked about this before, but I think it's worth just focusing on that. Like today, focusing yeah. on some of like your journey, the struggles you faced and things like that. But you know, a lot of people come to me and ask me like, well, what's the difference between between leading like a Western team and a global team? And you just touched, you just scratched the surface on, on yeah. that. And I, you know, we could, let's save that for a whole nother one. And, and if you're up for it, I'd love to have you come back and us and let's talk about like global leadership, what that means and what it looks like yeah. and the things you have to look for. Um, I'd love to, because it's interesting too, and we can bring it up when we have that conversation is even at Netflix, when uh, when our time was there, Niels and I, who's the other co my my partner uh, leading the creative part, uh, creative marketing production team, him and I focused a lot on um, the equity, diversity, inclusion program and looked at it from an Asia Pacific perspective. And what does that actually look like? And what mm -hmm. does that what is that inclusive inclusivity look like culturally between Japan? Korea, India, Southeast Asia. So we can get into that conversation later. Uh, yeah, but it was very insightful, some of the, the insights that we got from that, for sure. Yeah, so that's maybe that's the tease for a future podcast. <laughs> um, but yeah, just kind of to wrap up, um, what are you up to now? Um, how can people get a hold of you? What's what's the what's the best place for them, people, to find you? Yeah, um, so I, I think we mentioned earlier, I, I've joined a really exciting new uh, uh uh, sort of post product creative post production studio called Heckler. They are out of us. They're out of Sydney, Australia, but uh, we've got an office in Singapore. So I'm joining the Singapore office here as an executive producer. So I'm really excited to be a part of that team. I think uh, they've done some really, really great kind of work. The first statement to them to me was, "I'm like, well, what do you guys do? Like, we do really cool work." I'm like awesome <laughs> what does that mean um but i was like and i've seen some of their work and i'm like these are great they're like we just want to do really good work i'm like where's that balance let's let's and i think you know they they 
I think the part, the, the partnership between us and, and myself and with them, I think I hope they can contribute and bring sort of my experiences with, you know, working in such big studios like with film and Netflix and bringing that sort of capabilities to a smaller studio that can actually, you know, just build from that as well, you know, and hopefully make them even more successful. So I'm kind of, I'm, uh, I'm working towards that. Um, at the moment, and then, of course, you can find me on all your favorite uh, social channels. I'm I'm heavily active on LinkedIn, so it's always a good place to reach out to me as well. Um, I've got an Instagram page as well that I do. I don't really keep much. I've been told I should start a vlog, but I'm like uh, around music and 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 culture, and I'm like. Maybe at some point I'll I'll, I'll I'll get into that and, and so there's three things people say that they want me to do a, a, a podcast on um, music cocktail uh, culture and food I'm like interesting I'm like my wife and I are thinking about starting a cocktail podcast but we'll see we're like <laughs> dude I'm no down <laughs> I was a bartender in the past life <laughs> and you played music as well so I'm and like... I do play music as well and I don't don't think that the posters in the background have lost to me i definitely appreciate those those in the background you have there um uh, they, they okay. are what make they are what makes us so like, absolutely that's what time, so. yeah nothing can control a mood like music like if you can have be having the worst day and you put on a really amazing song and it's like yeah. mood changes instantly and i'm sure you know these uh, absolutely <laughs> <laughs> cool um well, we're out of time. Thank you, Amir, for taking the time. Um, Going to definitely have you back so we can have that global conversation. But yeah, Amir, executive Thank producer, so creative leader, talent manager, chef, uh, business <laughs> owner, like all the things. Thanks again for, for taking the time to be with us. Thanks for, the, thanks for having me, Rico. I loved it a lot. All right. Take care, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creative Leadership with Heart. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. If you're ready to make huge, lasting change in your life, then what are you waiting for? What will your life look like if you took action today? What would it look like if you didn't? If you're serious and you're ready, book your free strategy session today and let's make your future a reality.